Since 2016, we conducted research in the Pacific um, in regards to the connection between human rights, migration and climate change. And um, uh, the report which was published recently and launched at COP23 last week. It's actually a policy recommendation, it's a policy report done, uh, constructed uh, for the policy makers, for the negotiators to consider the findings of our research. Uh, the research focuses, um, and it has a legal niche and it focuses on the legal aspects of the three elements, climate change, migration and human rights. And uh, it's um, um, looking in particular to the discrepancies and gaps between the two systems of law which exist now in the Pacific, namely the domestic legislation, the one which governs the country, and we are very familiar with that, and the custom law or the traditional law, the law which is specific to the communities. And this is a uh, um, this is uh, something you can may find in most of the uh, post-colonial countries. Well, we have uh, seven main recommendations, but um, what it's um, what it's being uh, emphasized along the research and along the all the seven recommendations is that this connection between migration, human rights, and climate change become one concept, in instead of having three different concepts and they started to be very interlinked and interrelated. I won't use the word nexus necessarily because I personally don't enjoy that, but it's becoming one entity which started to grow from the legal perspective. So basically now, based on the research we conducted, you may not talk about migration without referring to human rights or climate change, as you don't, may not talk about climate change if you don't refer to migration or human rights and uh, it's not necessarily a cause-effect report, it's not a cause-effect relationship because they all of them can contribute to each other but it's mainly from the legal perspective um, you have a first effect and subsidiary effect regardless from which point of view you are looking at. They may be interpreted as being in the frame of human security, but they are uh, mainly framed in the legal, <coughs> in the legal approach. <coughs> and this is just one of the recommendations. The second recommendation, for example, will be that um, uh, the regional approach in uh, regulating migration, mm -hmm. it will be probably the most efficient method to have for the short and medium term periods of time. Um, for regulating migration in relation to environment, if you want to consider environment as a more inclusive concept of climate change and environmental degradation and disasters, for example. And um, this regional approach, it's complementary to the global process, which takes place now, the global compacts, which are going to be issued in 2018. And it's also complementary to the state's effort in order to regulate migration in particular internally have a as a sovereign right to do that as a sovereign issue and um, it's all and it's trying to bring in the conservation of values and traditions specific for us for that region better than any other state it will, it will do that individually The policymakers uh, see the regionalism as being something very productive. There is political will around uh, having a regional approach towards regulating migration in relation to the environment. But um, of course it's a slow process, it takes time, um, but it's much easier to negotiate with 32 countries or 34 countries instead of 190 something. So um, it's, it's, a matter of, it's a matter of efficiency once. And secondly, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of political perspective, having something which really helps the countries starting addressing preemptive measures versus humanitarian crisis. So they, start th they need to start thinking about regulating migration in a fashionable and human rights approach way mm -hmm. in order to avoid the humanitarian crisis in the future.
I think it was a working cup. Um, it wasn't uh, the expectations were not necessarily high in regards to the outcomes, mainly because the, there is there are no immediate deadlines for the committees and uh, for the for the for the agencies to come up with solutions. 2018 and 2020 are more a target years than mm -hmm. this year. Um, there are some decisions which have been taken. No, one of them is on loss and damage. Um, another one is on agriculture. Um, another one is uh, um, having on uh, um, having on finance, for example. But uh, uh, the one on loss and damage in particular, which I followed, and uh, uh, is. It did not go to the ministries, so it doesn't necessarily have a legal, legal strength, but opens another forum of discussion as Talanoa, which is known as Talanoa for next year, an initiative coming from Poland and Fiji, in order to facilitate better uh, um, in addressing loss and damage. But uh, the expectation, if you started the COP without high expectations, then you are fine. Considering the political environment we have now with countries which are not <coughs> necessarily very participative this year, mainly because of some uh, political um, political um, uh, assemblies, but if you come in with high expectations, then probably this was not necessarily a very productive one. Our institute has a long um, tradition, if you want, a long uh, history of influencing policymakers. For example, uh, uh, one not so very far, but not so so recent as well, um, um, influence huge influence of the policymakers is reflected in the paragraph 14f of the Cancun Adaptation Framework from 2010, when migration was for the first time mentioned in the fora of climate change, and that's a direct and a contribution of United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security. And since 2010, we influenced the, the process more or less by uh, contributing and the research. You may find it in the final product, in the final text, it's words, it's wording. It's not necessarily, you don't, they don't need to take everything from your research, but they are taking what is, they believe to be representative or important for them and for agendas. So, since 2010, EHS in particular has uh, uh, quite a history of um, finding wording coming from our research in, in, in the decisions taken at COP. Uh, well, um, 2018 would be a decisive year uh, in Katowice, in Poland, and uh, um, I hope that some, some, some big decision will be taken, in particular to loss and damage, and uh, implicitly the accessing the financial mechanism under the Paris Agreement. I uh, strongly hope that the, the, the politicians and the policy makers and the negotiators and the entire, all, all the states are starting to looking at migration and human rights in the context of climate change in a very, in a more productive way and in a more preemptive as well, as I said, not necessarily waiting for the crisis to appear. So uh, I'm optimistic because the science starts, is developing itself, our research, our UNU research helps that. And with the help of the science, it will be much easier for them to understand how all these things work and what they need to do.